starting. Okay, it, uh, Tegan, let's check your voice. So Tegan, looks like you're still muted. You're gonna wanna unclick that mic icon in the lower left. Awesome, I love that you guys posted your desk shots. Cool, okay, so let me see. Franco, how about you unmute and let's check your voice. Hey, how's it going? Excellent. Same thing with you, Franco. I've heard so much about you through Cat, and it'll be so fun to take a close look at your work today. Oh, that's so sweet. I just also, I live with Hannah Kim. She says hello. <laughs> right. Hannah was in Portugal with me and Kat. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, this is sort of the RISD world. <laughs> we all know each other. <laughs> yeah. It's so perceived. Yeah, it's really exciting to meet you too. Awesome. And Tegan, I think you are still muted. Let's try that again. I'm going to just type to you in the chat. You're still muted. Oh, cool. I love that you're all posting shots of yourselves and your studio spaces. It just makes it a little bit more fun. And I'm guessing most of us have home studios. Jack, is that the go. case for you? Oh, good. Tegan, let's check your voice. Looks like you're unmuted, Tegan. Let's see if your voice works. I totally thought I just heard you, Tegan. Now I still can't hear you. All right, let me just um, tag you again. Hopefully we can get that working. You are not muted, but I can't hear your voice. Okay, so hopefully you're getting that message, Tegan, and just jump No, I know, I'm sorry. I, I think I'm having some audio problems over here. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Okay, um, you want to go down to the lower left hand corner, there's a little gear icon. And if you click on that, you then want to go on, scroll down on the left, you wanna to go to voice and video and double check to see what the input is, or no, output, I think. Anyway, <laughs> take a look at that, Tegan. And until then, I can hear you by the way, Tegan. Um, and Taylor, let's check your voice. Hello. Yay. Can you hear me? That's working. Yay. Great. Okay, so Tegan, I'm just gonna type to you, I can hear you. Um, you're muted right now. That's fine. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming in early because it makes a big difference just to double check things, make sure we get here on time. And let's see, we've got Owen in the house. Can we check your voice, Owen? Hey, how? Yay! Voice up... is working well. You're oh. breaking up a tiny bit, but let's try it again. Tell me what you had for breakfast. I'm going to ask everybody. Okay, I had uh, egg on bread. Awesome. Nice and simple. How about... Yes. <laughs> Taylor, what did you eat for your breakfast? Oh, uh... I think I forgot to have breakfast because I got up early and I was packaging things and I was like, I, I remembered like halfway through the day, I was like, oh man, so, not the best example there, but yeah. Hey, you know, I feel like if I can wake up and not be totally disoriented, it's a win for that day. <laughs> it All definitely right. is. Let's find out, Gaz, what did you eat for breakfast? I I did not eat breakfast this morning. Oh! Uh, yeah, <laughs> I usually don't. But if it counts, I um, had a few munchkins that someone brought into work. So nice. I'll take <laughs> munchkins. <laughs> okay, let's check. Uh, Franco, what was your breakfast this morning? I I also had egg and bread. But let me paint you the picture. Let me paint you the picture because it was sourdough. Right? It was ham, it was arugula, it was a hard-boiled egg because I skipped the fried and mustard because I'm a freak. 
<laughs> so, that was the, the egg and bread. That is so fancy. I think, what did I eat today? I think I just grabbed a cereal bar because I was sort of in a rush. I mean, I'm in a rush every morning. I have to get two teenagers out the door, which let me tell you is a major hurdle every single morning. All right, Tegan, how about you unmute? Let's see if your thing is working. Yes, am I all good on your end? Yes, you are. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I think uh, I had an external monitor plugged in and that was uh, screwing with the speaker settings. That will do it. But I'm glad that we were able to work that out. And, you know, let me share my screen so that way everybody can see that. Let's just make sure everybody can see what's going on. So if you see under the voice channel, there's a red button that says live. And so you're going to want to click on that and that will allow you to watch my screen. So I'm looking at Taylor. Now I'm looking at a picture of Jack. If you cannot see those things, just type into the chat and I'm happy to help all of you find that. Awesome. Let's see. All right. I think we still have Tamara coming and, um, Taylor, it looks very bright and sunny where you are. Is it still like the afternoon for you? So Taylor, I think you're still muted. Oh, oh yeah, I'm in. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm on the West Coast. Yeah. That explains it. Very cool. <laughs> you know what I've noticed? Maybe I'm going to cause some ruckus here, but everybody's so nice in Utah. Like after coming from the East Coast, I lived on the East Coast for I think 15 years. I'm like, oh my God, people are nice. It's like really bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Owen, you're from Canada. And I don't know, did yes. you notice that people in the US on the East Coast are really not that nice? <laughs> Yeah, I so I don't know. Being in in the South now, I'm in I'm in Houston. Uh, definitely, people are a lot friendlier here. Um, but that being said, I don't know. I visited New York, and people were nice. Maybe people in Boston just aren't nice. Maybe that's it. In fact, I bet that's it because oh, when I went for a to um, <laughs> Vancouver, I was like, why is everybody being so nice to me? I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, those those Canadians, they're very nice, but they are a little passive aggressive, I will say. Oh, I have yet to experience that. Yes. So, I'm you met some of the good ones. Good. Oh, cool. We are seeing your desk gas and how cool. You look like you have a lot of room in there. My god, I've got two kids and Oh my god, there's no room because they fill everything up in my house. <laughs> oh, I hardly have any room, to be honest. <laughs> I, I managed to move some things around. Otherwise, my uh, workspace is really chaotic. So, um, yeah, I work small, but it kind of spreads out everywhere because of all the materials and things that I grab and use. Yeah, I was going to say, Gaz, that you do a lot of those miniatures, right? Yep. Yeah, that's what I've uh, really gotten into and in, like just before leaving RISD and following it. That's fantastic. I really wish we could have more people doing 3D because I love it. I mean, I feel like sort of a poser sculptor saying that because most of my stuff is 2D. But Jack, I noticed you have a couple 3D pieces on your Instagram. Yeah, I love 3D works. Um, I just didn't get a chance to work on it more uh, during uh, after COVID because uh, everything started accelerating. Give me a second. Yeah, well, I thought that was really cool because I know a lot of your work is illustration, but I just really like seeing that people are multifaceted, which unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people realize the value of that. In social media, I think a lot of people think they have to be this one thing but we really don't have to be. So I found that very refreshing. Thank you. I want to branch out more um, since um, I really into making furnitures. I have a lot of like furniture major friends in school 
oh. um, graduated and we collaborated on a couple of furnitures together. Um, I also worked on an inflatable castle actually that we designed a castle together and made into an inflatable, um, an inflatable sculpture. Yeah, that was a cool experience. Hopefully I can continue working on that in the future. Awesome. All right, Tamara, let's check your voice. So Tamara, looks like you're still muted. I'm gonna just type into here. You are still muted. So hopefully tomorrow we can get that up and running because I do want to make sure your voice, you can't hear anything. Okay, that's not good. Um, okay, so I'm going to type, so lower left, there is a gear icon. And then click on that. On the left, there is a menu. Scroll down to voice settings. So hopefully you get that worked out tomorrow because usually it's like the input is wrong or something. So let me know tomorrow and then we'll get very, we'll get started very soon. Okay. Oh, tomorrow looks like you deafened yourself. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to have nothing next to your name. Just type here. I think I just saw your voice, Tamara, for a second. Oh, no, it's still not working. I can hear you. You're very quiet, but I could pump up the volume. And I can see that you're talking, Clara, but you're not saying anything. Uh, oh, well, I'm saying something right now. Um, Tamara, if you're not on your phone, you might want to try your phone. I think sometimes um, the phone is a little bit easier. So I'm just going to type to you here, um, try your phone. For some reason on your phone, the voice seems to be a little bit smoother. So you might switch to your phone. Okay, cool. So Tamara, how about you try that? We're going to get started, but hopefully we can get that working. And Tamara, when it is working, type in the chat so I know that that is happening. All right, everybody, let's get started. Welcome to our workshop on selling your artwork. Couple of things before we get started. When you're not on voice, you wanna make sure you mute yourself. That way we get clean audio. And the way this is gonna work is we're gonna start by looking at each person's sites, and then we'll have a five minute break in the middle and if there is time after we get through everybody's stuff, we'll have time for a discussion where we can open it up a little bit more to different voices. And we'll also do a little bit of a Q&A. So if any of you have questions you wanna ask, you can definitely do that. I am sharing my screen right now. So if you cannot see that, you wanna go next to my name under workshop test voice, and you wanna click on the live button that should allow you to look at my screen. And the way it works is we'll get one of you on voice. I'll chat with you on voice about your various sites, but a big part of these workshops is you interacting with each other and making comments on other people's sites while I'm on voice with somebody. So for example, if I'm on voice talking to Franco, Gaz and Jack and Owen, everybody who's in here, tag Franco and that way, Franco can go back after the workshop is over and read your comments because that will give us much more diversity in terms of the opinions. So I really, really encourage you to do that if you possibly can. All right, let's start with Tegan. So Tegan, we have two sites you're looking at. We have the website and we also have your Instagram. So Tegan, can you give us a very brief overview of what kind of artist you are? Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, it's, I think it's pretty clear from looking at the site on a first impression. Uh, I, I definitely specialize in uh, digital fantasy illustration um, with, I guess, like a bit of a, uh, a surreal twist. Um, 
a lot of my uh, rendering style is like very fluid. I have figures that go like weave in and out between like the background and the foreground and become like parts of the environment that they're set in. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think that summarizes myself pretty well. I have a, uh, I mean, this page is focusing on uh, my mythological interests. Uh, it's another huge facet of what I am and what inspires me. Um, I find myself like doing a lot of historical research and how uh, like ancient people would like interpret the natural world and how that would translate into like mystical stories. Um, and so I try to like replicate that same sort of like sense of awe and wonder uh, just on like using contemporary media instead. And Tegan, for the most part, what are your tools? Is this all digital or do you have any traditional media that's part of your process? Uh, most of the time at this point, I'm working on digital. So uh, I go back and forth between Procreate uh, and Adobe Fresco software. Um, so for a lot of the like painterly portions of the work, uh, I prefer to use Procreate. Uh, it's a lot easier, uh, not only to like use some of their painting brushes on there, but also to uh, import uh, brushes from like that you just download online. Um, I've gotten a couple brush packs uh, from some people that uh, I follow on Instagram and really respect as artists. Um, and that stuff has helped out a lot. It's always a lot of fun to like try out different textures and uh, experiment with how you can make digital look as far from it as possible. Um, and then when I'm doing sketching, usually that's where I'll go to Adobe Fresco. Like they just have an absolutely superb a pencil brush that I will use above anything else. Like I've tried to use the pencil brushes in Procreate and like just to no avail, like they don't even compare. It's just something about the texture that's really satisfying to me. Terrific. All right, and how about you tell us, Tegan, what are your goals in terms of selling your work? So in terms of selling my work, uh, I, I definitely wanna market to the people who have like shared nerdy interests um because i mean like fantasy itself is like it's not niche as much anymore it is pretty mainstream uh but there's definitely like a specific audience it doesn't always sell to just about everybody um but that includes like uh people who play dungeons and dragons make up a huge portion of that um i would definitely want to market to um that group of people to see if I could do like, oh, uh, I do a lot of uh, character portraits. Um, I could do uh, characters for your campaigns. I could do like dramatic scenes from that. I could do uh, pantheons, like a lot of the, um, a lot of the lore in Dungeons and Dragons has like a, like a vast multiverse of uh, different gods and goddesses to choose from. So there's a lot of variety for like artistic interpretation. Um, I'd also be interested in doing uh, like music artwork as well. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time when I work, I'm listening to like some variant of like hard rock or metal. Um, and I've had actually uh, a few conversations with some people you know, who's like, oh yeah, like I'm friends with a band. Uh, I actually might be able to like bring you up in conversation a few times. Um, hasn't gone anywhere yet, but uh, just the fact that like the opportunity is out there is pretty uh, enticing. So, and then in terms of like the most immediate thing, uh, I'm planning on starting a deck project of my own mm -hmm. that's uh, focused on like a particular book series. Uh, and so I'm planning on trying to market to that group of like super fans first and foremost uh, to see if I can get people invested in a project of this scale. All right, so it sounds like your work could be in a number of different places. It could be on an album cover, it could be on a book cover, and you're also talking about physically producing cards, or would you do that through a company? Because there's a big difference between getting a company to use your work versus you making your own card deck and selling it by yourself. Uh, I think I'd like to go about the route of like making and selling it uh, on my own. Okay. Um, I know that like it, the content that I'm working with is like, obviously it's based off of a pre-existing book series. So I would have to like have a conversation with the author himself um, and see if we can like settle some sort of deal or like set something up. If I'm able to turn this passion project into something that we could produce for profit, 
Um, but I'm going to prepare myself for those conversations a little bit later down the road when I have like something more substantial to show for it. So Tegan, all of these images are from pre-existing stories written by authors? Not all of those, no. Uh, the uncanny illustration is, uh, as it describes up at the top, it's just like an archive of fantastical work. So a lot of those um, are just like personal projects. Okay. So if you're looking for the ones that are based off of pre-existing works, that'll be under uh, illustrated fiction. Got it. Okay. So let's take a quick glance at that. Okay. And so a lot of the things you're talking about are things you have yet to do. Although I do see in this post, although ugh, Instagram wants me to log in, can't do that right now because of the computer I'm on, but it does seem like you've done prints and I know you've done some fairs. How have those gone for you? Well, uh, the RISD craft fair that we just had, uh, like what, a week ago? A week? Yeah, I think so. Um, that one was actually incredibly successful. And that's the first one of like that size that uh, either Gaz or myself had been a part of before. Uh, the two of us ended up sharing a table that day. Um, so it was great to have like a built-in hype man uh, as well. Yeah. So we were able to get everybody like talking about our work and passionate about what we brought to the table. Um, so it was, it was definitely uh, a validating experience because prior to that we had only been to, or at least I had only been to uh, this like incredibly small illustration sale. Uh, and it was only like held next to the building. It was just like a much smaller group of passerby people that didn't really want to spend their money. Um, and not to mention like I was in school, I was going through a huge amount of uh, you know work related stress. So I didn't really have a lot of time and energy to invest in presenting myself professionally. Uh, luckily, with the benefit of having graduated um, in about like a month and a half to prepare, uh, the RISD Craft Fair was uh, a lot more successful for that reason. We could definitely be more like considerate in what we were presenting and how we were doing it. Great. And tell me really briefly, what are your frustrations with social media, with selling? Where are the roadblocks for you where you're like, I want this to happen? but it hasn't happened yet. And I need to make a push to really go in that direction. Yeah, I think a, a lot of like my core hangups are probably personal. Like as you uh, like summarized in the critiques from the other night, it's a like an overall reluctance to uh, personalize social media. Like I haven't really been like public on any form of social media since around like late high school. Um, so I think just trying to like get back into that and comfortable with expressing um, like a live portion of myself online is uh, a big hang up. Yeah, it's a big hang up for everybody. <laughs> and it took me years to get over it. I mean, for real, it's only been in the past year that I've been comfortable taking selfies because I find them really cringy. They're so awkward. They don't look very good a lot of the time. But there are ways around these things. For example, a lot of people think, oh, I'll just take one selfie. I'm like, no, I take 20 selfies and maybe I'll get one that looks good. And so you'll find that a lot of social media and your online presence, it has a lot to do with just producing photos. So when I tell a lot of people, listen, stock up, get lots and lots of photos of yourself because yeah, some of them might not be your favorite, but you will get better at it. So are you worried that if you show more of yourself, that will be an invasion of your privacy? Or do you feel like, oh gosh, I'm so naked and exposed? Or can we get to the heart of what that hangup might be? I think it's more of like a naked and exposed sort of thing. Um, like I just, yeah, I, I haven't really like, uh, expressed myself in a personal way for such a long time. Like I was most comfortable with like putting stuff up that like my friends would see. So, uh, I knew who my audience was as opposed to trying to like, not only present myself as like a normal functioning person, but <laughs> as a professional artist who makes content. Yeah, it's a big leap. And I can tell you that I know you substituted this photo on your about page and it's a big difference. 
I hate yeah, to tell the, you that all that. was actually the first one that I used. The other one was technically a more recent picture. It was just absolutely dreadful lighting. So I'm glad you brought that up, though. Well, because you look like somebody I might be able to relate to. The other one, I'm like, what sci-fi movie are you in? Because the lighting was just strange. And I'm noticing... In, uh, the 86 version of Doom. Yeah, I know. And you know something? You really caught my eye here because you're very specific. You say, ever since perusing a copy of Dallaire's Greek Myths, guess what? That was my favorite book when I was a kid. And yes. I read that book over and over and over again. And by you sharing that piece of your life, I made a connection to you. And I did not have that before when I initially looked at this page. All right, awesome. Uh, I'm glad that worked. I, I kept rewriting that uh, like couple of sentences like, 10 or 12 times because like I wouldn't find the words but I think focusing on that made it a lot easier to like ground the description yes because you know something one thing that all of you can do here is ask yourselves okay well, where does my work fit in the larger art world I think for your work it's very clear you're interested in fantasy illustration okay and the thing is if you think about that field you can say oh my god there's so many people who do fantasy illustration, okay? What do you have that nobody else has? Because I can't tell you how many narratives bios where people have said, from the time I was five, I loved dragons. And then I got very passionate about fantasy and I love it so much and it impacts readers and I wanna share that with the world. Like that is so generic. And the more specific you can get about who you are in a way that's comfortable for you. For example, I set very clear boundaries about my kids. I will not post a picture of them. I will not tell people what their names are. So there certainly are parts of your life that you can consider to be absolutely private. And sometimes for a lot of people, they've never actually sat down and told themselves, hey, this is what I won't share. This is what I will share. And once you have those defined boundaries, it can be very helpful. So tell me really briefly, what are some parts of your life that you feel like are totally off limits? For me, it's my kids. Ah, that's actually, that's a great question. I guess um, I haven't really thought about that too much. Yeah. It, establishing what's off limits. Um, I don't know. It seems like it, like a moment to moment sort of comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, like when I feel like it, like I I could find myself posting like oh I'm going out like with this group of people yada yada, um, but I guess like private jokes and like just more like pure comfortable evenings I'd probably want to just like keep to myself. Mm -hmm. Well, you um, can also you know, I find myself hard to like. You can think about it in terms of people. Actually, you can say mm -hmm. okay, my parents. I don't want to share my parents online or hey my parents are super cute and fun i do want them to be online so i do think it would make it so that what you share is not a spur of the moment decision that you've already decided nope not going to show my cousin never going to show my niece or say you know what i've got four guinea pigs and an axolotl i'm going to take all these photos and share those because they're my silly pets and i think that that's perhaps one of the things that's holding you back is that you haven't defined what's private and what's professional and it becomes very confusing if you don't sit down and really think about that very clearly so that's almost this gigantic hurdle that you have that's keeping you from really releasing the personal parts of you like the Dallaire's mythology book which does engage your audience mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you put it in terms of people, like, yeah, I, I probably would keep my family, like, a part of things, or, like, out of things for the most part. Yep. I mean, I can't help my parents posting picture of, <laughs> pictures of me online. My, I wish I had my dad's confidence when you were talking about, like, taking pictures of yourself earlier. Yep. Uh, like, my, my dad has 100% leaned into just, he, he has not a care in the world. He would put up whatever cringy like dad content he wants like at any given time and he'll put up like five selfies a day and each one of them's like <laughs> perfectly color corrected <laughs> like dramatic photos of the clouds with like a song lyrics going to it like he's he's very open about that so right. maybe i should ask him for advice you know something tegan just wait their minimum level wait 30 years you'll be so old you don't care about anything <laughs> that's basically what happens is you give up 
on all the same. Oh but... yeah, no, he's definitely reached that level, and I, you know, I gotta respect him for that much at least. But yeah, that that would be your main obstacle right now. Is the thing is, if people can't connect with you, they can't connect with your work so much because the fact of the matter is, people have no attention online. I mean, it's horrifying if you've ever watched somebody like somebody you give them your website. You'd be amazed this website you slaved over. People are through it in about three minutes. And the thing is, you have to find that latch. For me, it's that Dolaire's book that you mentioned. Now I'm like, oh, yes, now I'm seeing where all the fantasy illustration comes from. If I just look at the fantasy illustration, yes, I can get into the work, but you want to have your audience latch onto you. And those personal tidbits that are not uncomfortable, that is a very fast way to make that happen. Okay, very cool. Let's go back and we're going to take a look at Tamara. And Tamara, hopefully this works. We have a great picture of you in your office. And remember, everybody, keep writing comments. We want comments from each other about your work, about your sites whatever you can share because the interaction here is not just me and you it's all of us together so put those comments into the chat as we're looking at things okay tomorrow let's check your voice can you hear me yes i can awesome yay i moved to my phone good so so basically this is my instagram i changed some things or already. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a illustrator. I do very, I like children's books right now. I just got a job at a publishing company. So I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, uh, I make like coloring books, but this is just my personal work. I can't really show anything that I'm doing at my job. So it's just this stuff. Um, and it's been hard. Uh, number one, when it comes, and then my website, I've been doing just like, I have like character design page. If you refresh, I actually moved something in this. I moved this, this square down mm -hmm. and replaced it with a different square. Sure. Um, what was kind of interesting that I just want to say really fast is that they looked at my website um, when I was looking, getting this job, but um, I brought my iPad in, so I didn't really go to my website when I was showing them anything. I showed them my, like, my iPad and everything through there. So I think that was kind of interesting that I didn't really use my website to show my work because I wanted them to, sh to see other things like that stuff but i did use my website to show them my ink drawings good and tomorrow and... tell me what are your goals for selling i think you mentioned in the chat doing conventions and art fairs yes so i went to an anime convention and a lot of different artworks there i know i'd have to do fan art of those things um that's especially what like people like to buy there but i also think that I would love to just sell my work in that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to make, I also, what I thought was really interesting that Tegan said is that they were working on a card set. I'm also working on a card oh. set um, with my cousins. Um, he wants to, my uncle apparently want, knows someone or like knows how to get like card sets in like stores at like gift shops so we wanted to make I wanted to make a dinosaur one and I just haven't gotten to the time to mm. finish it but I really want to do that um so I would be doing that myself and then he would be helping me like market it to places to sell mm. um besides that um I'd want to make like um prints and maybe stamp something on t-shirts or something it's just been really expensive thinking about like how to print all that stuff mm -hmm. um so i haven't really been able to really branch out yet until i get like a 
booth at a place and like really know so I can commit. Art fairs and are I also but yeah, are, are you open to having an online shop? Because the thing I would say about fairs is you can do very well at some of these fairs. But the thing is, in between the fairs, if you don't have an online shop, you're basically cutting out many days out of the calendar when you could be making sales. So I had an Etsy for two seconds, <laughs> but I got rid of it because you know, they take a cut and I don't know which site is the best if I want to use something like Etsy or if I want to like get something through Wix so it's my own shop. And then I also have to make sure that people, you know, there's a demand for something like people say that they want things, but they can't afford them or they right. don't commit. And I can't commit to like, yeah, I can give you this on a t-shirt. I can't commit to that if you know, no one actually wants to buy things. So it just hasn't happened. You guys have any advice for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us in the chat, the rest of you here, who here feels overwhelmed by the number of options? Because Tamara, I think what's happening right now is you're feeling like there's too many options and you don't know which one to choose. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. And they all seem bad. <laughs> they yeah, all they all seem, seem that bad. way. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about print on demand? Because I'll tell you, there's really no longer a reason to order a bunch of physical t-shirts, ship them to your house, and then individually box them out to people. Print on demand is so nice. Because really all you do is you just upload the file, write a short listing, and boom, it's on your shop. You don't have to lift a finger when somebody orders that t-shirt. So if you have not looked into print on demand, I absolutely would because it sounds to me, and I, I think you've in the past just bought physical shirts. I didn't even, I guess that's really interesting because I think I tried to do something similar, but I didn't really like actually commit to it when I had the Etsy shop because I was going to wait till someone bought it and then I was going to print it no that's a pain. Um, <laughs> don't do yeah, that yeah and I also I also didn't want to do that either because I didn't want to advertise that I was doing anything because I didn't know how long it was gonna take right for me to print it out so it's yeah I also wanted to talk to you really fast about reels because mm -hmm. you were talking about my reels being really like weird Mm -hmm. And I totally agree. My reels are a mess. And the only reason I make them is because they do 80 billion times better than my still photos, because that's what Instagram is like pushing right now. Right. And I still get likes on the reels. So like, is there any way I could, you know, make those better, but still, I don't know. It's like, I hate that I have to do it, but it does, it is beneficial because more people see my work. Yes. And I get more likes and like, I'm still getting likes on older reels that haven't, that like I made like weeks ago. So they are beneficial, but if they look really bad, <laughs> that's not good either. <laughs> I'd love to hear in the chat who here has made a reel and what have you found challenging about it? Because yes, Instagram is pushing reels way more over posts at this stage. So here's the thing about reels especially when it comes to relating that back to selling your work, is that you have to look at what is everybody doing? So if you go onto Instagram and you watch a bunch of artist reels, it's either a time lapse, which is so easy to make, you just get it off Procreate, stick it on, put on some music, you're done, okay? But I can tell you those reels, they get boring very fast. And there's somebody I follow on Instagram, I'm not gonna name them, but every single reel they make is exactly that. And so when I watch one of their reels, I already know what I'm gonna see. I don't have any type of surprise. And so while cutting a good reel, it's way more work. And honestly, we need to hold a workshop to walk through the logistics of that. But cutting a good reel, it's work. And a lot of people just don't wanna do that. So you have to make a decision if you are finding, yes, the reels are getting me results, do I wanna just keep posting those super quick time lapses because they are fast to post? Or 
do I want to really invest more effort? Do I want to use Video Leap, which is a wonderful editing app? Do I want to have to shoot way more footage? Do I want to only release a reel once a week versus three times a week? Those are all decisions you have to make. So I think what I'd recommend, you have to start making decisions and you have to stop feeling like I have to do everything because you don't. And then in terms of a selling platform, I think um, Etsy is not a good fit for you because if you want to do merch and mugs and all that fun stuff, Etsy is not the place. You should be on Redbubble or you should be on Society6 because those are set up to be print on demand. They make it easy. Etsy's for more original artworks. You got to write a listing for everything. You have to photograph it. So it's important to say, okay, what platform fits the work? For me, okay. Etsy's a good fit. I don't do merch. But what, but doesn't Society6 and also Redbubble like really bad for artists though? Apparently they take like 60%. I mean, they do do all the stuff, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Well, so Would you have to make a decision. Do I want to pay yeah, those true. fees that come with those platforms or do I want to do it totally on my own? And honestly, you guys, and I'd love to hear from people. Does it bother you? Oh, goodness. If I do Etsy, I have to be charged this. Oh, PayPal takes a cut. Yeah, they do. But you know something? The convenience factor is so high. And honestly, these sites do not charge that much. I know it bothers people that they charge stuff, but guess what? They're doing a lot of stuff. They take a lot of things out of your hands because one of the reasons I have an Etsy shop is that I know it's regulated. So if something happens, there's a dispute over an invoice, there's Etsy support to help me. Now, if it's on my website and there's a dispute, oh man, you are on your own. And so you have to ask yourself, is it worth paying those fees to have that peace of mind about certain things? Or do I really care that much about losing that percentage? Which honestly, I don't think is a lot. Sounds good. Um, also, so I used to have a picture of my face on my website. Mm -hmm. The reason I took it down is because it blew up when I would, it, it was like way bigger than any other. Oh. <laughs> on my website that's bad. it looks really weird yeah like yeah, yeah. is that like that's worse right like that's worse it's like and here's me well <laughs> yeah like, I, you don't strange. want that basically it's a web design issue you have to figure out i mean call support whatever you need to wix do to figure that changed. out it hmm. looks like wix changed and i can change the size of things like my header and stuff which is like brand new like mm -hmm. last month i couldn't do any of this so um i'll put my picture back up yeah. i think i can fix it definitely so that's good and then my advice to you tomorrow in general don't try to do everything all at once don't say i'm going to open redbubble and i'm going to do conventions and blah, blah, blah. you can't do that you can do one thing at a time because so much of selling is trial and error you think, oh, I'll yeah. do this and it's going to do so well. And then it pff, flops. And other times you're like, I'll just throw this on. And it's like, oh my God, this drawing I hate. All these people are buying it. And so the thing is you, you can't hold yourself back and say, well, I'm not going to do it until I'm ready. No, I'm not going to do it until I figure this out. You just have to throw out all these arrows and all these different directions. You just have to try it and then say, you know what? That didn't work. I'm not going to do, I'm going to do something else. And you have to be okay with that. Um, yeah, there's also like this other thing that I think is, it might be a thing that you guys also have, but I have like this problem with social media where I feel like it needs to be perfect mm -hmm. and I will like scrutinize it to like the craziest amount where like I can't function if there's anything that I feel like is weird or I don't know right like it's just very strange um it's not like when I decided and I it's so bad <laughs> like I need to stop doing this like you told me a couple like months ago like in the spring like to post some th certain things in a certain way and I just didn't do it because I like couldn't do it <laughs> because of my yeah. like mental Ness. Like, I don't know why I have that problem, but I need to figure that out. Like, I don't know. It's a balance I, 
because if you want to have good quality work, of course, you're not going to just throw anything out there, but it does become paralyzing. So I'm wondering, tell us in the chat, everybody, who here has that feeling that, oh, I can't put it out there because I want everything to be, quote, perfect. I want everything I put out there to be really, really good. But you know something? The consequence of that is you don't put out anything. And that's even worse. Like, it is better for you to put out something that is, let's say, a B-plus project, okay? You don't need to be an A-plus person. You can be. At a certain point, you just have to give up on some of those things. And I think right now it's holding you back. I think that worry of it's got to be perfect everything. Because you know something? I'm sorry to burst your bubble, everybody. People are not paying that much attention to you. And the thing is, when they do start really paying attention to you, oh, believe me, you will know it. Because let me tell you, I never got rude comments on YouTube until we really had a big following. For the longest time, it's just crickets. But use that to your advantage. Because one of the things about not having a big following is you can try stuff and you won't have a big audience. Like, because we have a big audience at ArtProf, I do have to worry because I will get so much crap about it from a billion people if I don't think it through. But I think, Tamara, you have to just put it out there. And you know something? If it's that bad, delete, delete, delete. That's all you need to do. Yeah, that's true. That's what I'll do. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. How about let's get Owen onto voice? Sorry, it was just in the chat there, so had to yep. move back to Instagram. But no uh, yeah, um, so yeah, so this is my uh, Instagram. Um, I, similarly to Tamara, and with the help of my um, amazing wife, who's like pretty much my manager, um, <laughs> scrutinize over uh, all the paintings being uploaded being like kind of to a certain quality uh personally i just like uh ever since i've kind of gotten more traction uh on my work i kind of have thought like okay well if i'm gonna follow this account uh i want like everything he posts to be like a finished painting right that's like very detailed and very uh shareable because i noticed uh with instagram the stuff that does really well is when some it's like when someone wants to reshare it to their story mm -hmm. uh and i noticed with me like when i was posting stuff that was like fully finished fully rendered it would get like you know more shares than um some something that uh wasn't as rendered so yeah but I also scrutinize over it a lot. So that's definitely <laughs> like a struggle. And I also don't put out that many posts. Right. So I would like to find a way to, to get more stuff out there. I mean, I imagine that because these are very large oil paintings that they take a long time to make, correct? Yes, yeah. They're actually acrylic paintings. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, they, they take a while, um, usually on the short end if i'm doing something like really small it will take me maybe t like a week to two weeks but on the long end it's like four to six weeks sure yeah um and yeah mm -hmm. i'm wondering have you ever posted a really crummy sketch that you just scribbled and had the experience where it gets more reaction than a painting you slaved over for 30 hours I I I have not been bold enough. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like I don't know. I I'm just like I I'm so I guess I'm just so self conscious of the of the the sketches. I'm like oh this is crap. Like I I gotta gotta put out the the polished rendered stuff. I guess sure. Because I once did this. I'm not joking. Two minute sketch of freaking ducks in my crappy little <laughs> sketchbook with not even an art pencil and so many i'm like you guys this is some crummy sketch i put together why do you like this and then i'll post this thing that i spent hours and hours on and it's like crickets and so you have to ask yourself well, why is that the case because from an artist's point of view it doesn't make sense and in fact to a certain degree it almost feels insulting <laughs> that people like yeah. the crummy <laughs> duck sketch you know it, it feels kind of crappy but the thing that i would ask all of you to think about 
for people to want to follow you online. Your work either has to be aspirational or it has to be relatable, okay? And I'll tell you, to be honest, the aspirational stuff kind of drives me crazy because I'm like, nope, my house is not that clean. I don't look like this Hollywood star. <laughs> like, it just makes me mad. So I don't relate to the aspirational posts. Some people do, that's fine. But the relatable posts, that is what gives people an entry point to who you are. And that's why sketches are really popular because they're relatable. I mean, who here doesn't mm. make crappy sketches or crummy little things? I mean, tell me in the chat, do you do stuff like that? And if you say you don't, you are totally lying. And Owen, what are your goals for selling? So, um, so far, all the selling I've had has actually just been through like galleries and Instagram DMs. So I was uh, lucky enough, like this uh, big collector kind of found me through Instagram uh, and like bought uh, one of my paintings like as soon as I graduated from RISD. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of made me realize like, oh, the art world is changing. Like yes. you don't necessarily need that like, you know, crazy resume or, or like certain gallery approval for collectors to find you nope. and uh, want to buy your stuff. So, so yeah, I, I got um, kind of lucky with that. Uh, so I just kind of invested in uh, like, yeah, like building my Instagram uh, and then like a couple more collectors bought stuff and one who, um, put me in touch with like these two galleries that I'm working with now. Uh, so I guess my goal is just to like, so I actually have um, two shows coming up. I have uh, one in March in Italy with a gallery called Monty 8 and one in, uh, in May with this gallery called Harkowick uh, in LA. And so oh, that great and like, build that stuff so yeah definitely more like fine arty uh hopefully one day i i want to like build like maybe do some prints uh i recently actually partnered with this uh mental horse health organization in toronto uh and they just were like hey like you we can make like a print of yours and like all the proceeds will go to charity and it was kind of a great opportunity because like I could gauge my audience of like, okay, like who would actually like buy a print from me? Um, and I haven't gotten the results from that yet just because it was so soon, but um, yeah, definitely looking to expand into prints and uh, hopefully just like, I don't know, just like cool kind of like products, like in terms of like, okay, like, you know, what would someone want to buy? I don't know if that's like kind of like a box of prints where I kind of design this box and make it really like fancy and nice. Um, but yeah, so that's where I'm at. Well, that's amazing that you have those gallery contacts. And I'm glad you shared those stories because a lot of the times Instagram feels like you're just shouting into the void. And it's very frustrating when you don't get any results, but it's like, the way one of my colleagues used to describe it, he said, it's like your art career, it's like a room with all these arrows, okay? And the arrows are going in all these directions and you have no idea what's going on. And really all you need is for two arrows to touch. You need them to touch on the point. That is not that likely, but it's like when it happens, it happens. And that's what's tricky for a lot of us is just feeling like, oh my God, nothing's happening. And then it's like, boom, something happened. It's, it's one little DM that you get on Instagram that results in a gallery connection. So a lot of this for a lot of you is patience. It's just, you have to be okay with no results for a while. Now you are getting results, but one thing I want you to consider is how much your subject matter is actually gonna dictate what people buy. And it's not, I'm sorry to tell you this, you beautiful painting technique, but a lot of people don't really care about that stuff. What people do care about oftentimes is the image itself. So I think you had an image of a dentist chair. I think it was in um, another oh, one. Oh, 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And 
it's amazing because somebody once told me that they had this drawing of a telephone pole with all these wires and you know it doesn't sound that exciting to buy but you know who bought it an electrician and people don't realize that that is sometimes what gets people to do it i wouldn't be surprised if a dentist saw this painting and said oh wow this is kind of cool i need this for my office or whatever and so i think you have to realize that it's not just galleries and all that but it's like people really look for certain things that relate to them mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah um yeah for sure uh a funny kind of story branching off that is so i i made a painting of myself on the toilet mm -hmm. um and that painting is the painting that uh got me into these galleries Mm -hmm. So I thought no one would want to buy this, and a guy messaged me and was like, Owen, I have a collection of toilet paintings. <laughs> like, I have ten toilet paintings, and this fits perfectly, and and I, you know, he was a very nice guy. So, um, yeah, it's, again, on subject matter. I My parents saw me doing this, and they're like, Owen, what are you doing? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I think a lot of people sometimes equate sales with how good is this painting, okay? And, and you, that's not the case. No, yeah. it's not. I mean, I think back here you had some paintings. I don't know anything about sports. Which team is this? <laughs> the Raptors. The Raptors, okay. Like, if I'm a major Raptors fan and I sort of appreciate art a tiny bit, this is not difficult for me to want to buy this piece. It's almost like, ha ha, slam dunk in terms of purchase. <laughs> and so a lot of you, I recommend, don't try to judge your sales based on how good is this painting? Oh, how good is this digital illustration? A lot of the times, this is what makes people buy work. Definitely. And I think it would be a good idea for you to explore other formats simply because your paintings do take a long time. They're very big. They're almost like these epic pieces. And I'll tell you that most artists, even very successful painters like capital A, art world painters, like Will Cotton's a very trendy, cool New York City figurative painter, but he also does prints because the prints can sell to a much broader audience. Like you've only got one painting of this piece called Sleep. And yeah, you can sell it, but it's like the image can have another life beyond the canvas. Yeah, yeah that's that's a good idea. I, it's definitely something I, I'm kind of struggling with and yeah, I want to find like a, a nice kind of thing that will save my butt when the like painting I don't know just goes away right well one thing I would encourage everybody here and tell us in the chat who here has made merch in the past because I think merch it becomes this thing where people are like here's a painting I'm going to slap it on everything and it's like that doesn't get results so I think you mentioned something about making a box that has prints in it can you elaborate a little more yeah, so um, obviously, like, my my paintings are, like, very personal and kind of about my life and all that stuff. And so, like, I love the idea of, like, you know, people making, like, decks of cards. and But, like, I just know personally, like, the work I make doesn't fit with that. But I do kind of like this idea of, like, maybe making, like, a box of prints. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like that way it's like they're still kind of together as a collection of images but um you know they're not necessarily like you know playing cards or something like that i do really like the idea of grouping these <laughs> paintings because your work is very cohesive and i'll tell you when you look at one painting yes i can appreciate it on its own but when i look at them like on your instagram as a collection they really look fantastic together and so you could even make groupings. Like you could say, okay, th this is three paintings that belong together. These belong together. And think about ways to do that because like everything else, like the reels of time lapses, those are easy to make. Everybody does that. And it's like, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, this is way, way more work, 
but this is how you stand out because then anybody can just order a print. Hey, I'm selling these prints. And, and that's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but oh my God, think about all the artists out there making prints of their paintings. It's like really overwhelming. And so when you do something that's not expected, let's say, um, I mean, actually I had a former student who turned her pieces into textiles, which I was like, what? Like, <laughs> that seems so weird, <laughs> but she printed them on silk and it looked beautiful. I I'd never what? even thought about that. So I'm not saying you should do that, but step outside sure. of the norm when it comes to things to put your work on top of. Definitely. Yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds good. Yeah, I think just, yeah, just exploring like different products and again like it's funny to me that anyone wants to like buy this work anyways just because <laughs> it's like a wife I'm like all right like cool um so yeah just I just trying to figure out what people like so great all right thank you Owen so we're going to look at Taylor and then we'll take a five minute break and then go back to Gaz Franco and Jack and keep those comments coming in the chat because I think the more we commiserate with each other, the more we compare notes, the more a lot of this actually starts to make a little bit of sense because it, it does feel very chaotic for a lot of people. Okay, Taylor, how about you hop on voice and give me a quick Hi. sum up of what kind of artist you are. Hi, um, I'm Taylor. I, well, I have it in my bio here. I do illustration and comics and zines and I also do like some tattoo design mm -hmm. that's mostly what I do just like illustration and comics that's usually what it can be summed up by and yeah great so I saw in your site I think it was here it is okay this is your tumblr actually so you have a lot of zines uh, and... oh yeah this is that it's you yeah yes uh, oh no, here's your shop. Okay, so you've got stickers, mm -hmm. you've prints, you have zines. And um, how have these been going so far? Are you happy with the sales? Are you frustrated with your shop? Um, I feel like for the past year, I kind of haven't um, been doing like as much marketing or emphasis as I, as I could be because I've, I've been busy with a lot of different things so that's been a little frustrating i think last year was kind of like when i um, did a lot more when i did a lot more of it uh, i kind of started selling around 2018 when i gra when i graduated that's when i kind of started my shop and then i did a lot of like uh, i would do like a lot of different promotion things and then last year i did a lot of um like store and commission mission work but since it's usually pretty relevant it's usually pretty based on like kind of staying relevant and you know like post posting a lot contacting you know people people a lot so that's something I, I feel like i usually in order to get like business i have to um, be right. more active with that which i haven't done as much yeah so this is something i want everybody to consider and it obviously depends on your situation but I'm looking at your work, Taylor, and your work, you've got a lot of it, first of all, which is fantastic. But you also have work in just so many different formats. And what you might consider, and everybody else as well, is actually taking away a few things so you can expand more in depth on one area. Because there is a logic to that. For example, I used to go to this farmer's market when I was in Italy and you know, there's some stands, they'd have all these different vegetables, you get all these different things. Okay. But there's this one woman, her entire cart was mushrooms. She didn't sell anything else. Okay. And I, I just loved <laughs> that dedication of only mushrooms, but it let me focus more when I went to her stand mm -hmm. because I was like, I know when I'm going there, I'm getting mushrooms. You know, sometimes I go to these other stands and there's like 50 different varieties of lettuce. And I'm like, what do I do here? And so have you thought about maybe, or even you could confine it to different sites. You could say, okay, on Tumblr, I'm gonna sell this. On Instagram, I'm gonna sell this. I mean, whatever strategy you wanna do, but have you thought about actually focusing more on less? So you're not having to do everything all at once. 
Uh, a little bit, yeah. I think like for my for my tattoo design stuff, I actually have like separate uh sort of gallery and account sort of for that. Um, I've been thinking about having different store pages, but then been wondering about like how that might figuring out how to um, I guess pra- practically organize that mostly. So yeah, yeah. I guess it's just mostly how to kind of draw how to get like the audiences you want for like the kind kind of work right i want to do because yeah because usually i've been trying to kind of keep my casual stuff also separate so i have like a lot of stuff on on private accounts as well that i do but Mm -hmm. yeah i think definitely trying to find like a focus for for what i have and make sure it gets to the people who, who are looking for it i think definitely important yeah because i think my impression of all your sites taylor is that you're trying to juggle too many things all at once and the consequence of that is that the work you do have it's almost like it gets diluted a little bit Mm -hmm. and as somebody who's visiting your shop let me go back to the shop page okay here's the shop okay Mm -hmm. um so many different things here and also they're not really broken down so for example here we have zines and then here we have the charms oh wait that's oh yeah (laughs) yeah you don't want to have an empty page get rid of that and um you also have prints i guess i just want more organization because Mm -hmm. if your store is disorganized or too fragmented or lopsided as a customer it, it sort of for lack of a better word, it makes me sort of lose confidence in you. And one thing I've seen, I mean, myself, is I need to feel that I trust the seller, okay? So if I go buy Mm -hmm. something at Target, I know Target is going to fulfill the order. It's fine, you know? But people are suspicious of sellers online if they don't know those people. It does help. Like Etsy, you can get reviews that people leave, and I always read them. Like, I'm always like, okay, does this person fulfill the orders, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I think it would really help you to just cut back on a couple of things. And it's hard to do that. None of us want to do that, okay? To like remove something from the shop almost feels like a missed opportunity, but it's not. What you're providing is more focus so that your customers can more easily navigate what they see. Because I'm going through all your various sites and, and to be honest, you're losing me in a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And it could be that maybe you get creative with how you use these images. For example, we have here the zines. You could say, okay, let's take Voids and Visions, this one booklet that you have here, and I'm gonna make a whole series of stickers based on the images in that book. And that's one sticker section. So it's sort of like taking what you already have and then letting that thing get bigger as opposed to jumping from place to place, I think would be helpful. Yeah, just sort of like uh, working off like um, one one thing at a time, sort of, in a way. Yeah. Well, because here you have comic zine bundle, Bible theme comics and zines, and e- even this doesn't really look that cohesive, this image that you have here. And I think there is something that is very cohesive about seeing, okay, I have this one theme and now here are all the variations, okay? And that might be really fun. And you know something else, once people see there are many variations, they are more likely to buy it. Because here's the thing, a lot of people would say, oh, okay, I've got this one painting, I wanna sell that one painting. But the thing is, if you have nine other paintings that are very similar in terms of theme, it's actually more likely that people will buy more than one. So for example, if you have a bunch of stickers, let's say they're all based on this comic, Behold. A lot of people go, oh, this is a series from that zine, and wouldn't that be fun to own 10 of them instead of just one or two at a time? So if you think about maybe creating bundles based on work you already have, it's just a little bit of administrative work to get the individual stickers and to obviously get the pages up but i i just think you've got so much great work 
but it's like I'm looking in all these different directions. It's hard to focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think I definitely could use some more uh, organization and curation in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that, like with the with the bun with that specific bundle, because I think that kind of came across as like a request because they are they were all kind of works that were thematically similar that people often bought together so mm -hmm. that's why i ended up kind of making it in a in a single bundle in that sense but yeah i see i definitely see what you mean about um if you're approaching it from someone looking at the site and trying to make decisions from what they are given in that, in that sense one thing and this is good advice for everybody is it's very important looking at any of these sites let's pretend taylor i don't know anything about you and all of a sudden I'm on your website okay mm -hmm. and let's go to the home page so we can see that a little bit better so I know nothing about you okay and at first glance without clicking on anything I'm going who the heck is tomato bird I don't know <laughs> and so that's one thing it's not to say you can't use it but it, it is a little easier when people see a name somewhere so maybe tomato bird art is your selling name but it would be helpful to have your real name down here because I think, again, it's sort of like a trust thing. Like if you don't want to reveal to me who you are, it feels a little bit strange. And I'm sure there are people out there that do that. But I can tell you from a trust point of view, that makes me feel more comfortable to know, okay, this is a person and they're real. And if I just look at your menu bar, nothing else, I go, okay, you've got zines, you've got comics and illustration. And this is my, again, first impression blog. Oh my gosh, you're so out of date. This is no longer the 2000s. So there are things like that. And you do have a good record here in that this stuff is up to date, but this is the type of thing I wish was on your social media. I feel like, yeah, put it in the blog, but I would like to see more of that on social media and I wanna see more of you. It's a similar thing is what I was talking to Tegan about, which is that you've got a big wall that you don't want to share yourself with people but you know something okay here's a question taylor who is somebody mm -hmm. you follow yeah. online that you really really like to the point that they could read a phone book and you would listen um let's see uh dylan mcconnell probably okay i don't know i'm just like i'm just sorry but yeah so tell me but... Why do you like him so much? Um, I I just think um, uh, I I'm a f I'm mostly a fan of her comic and illustration work, and so I follow that a lot. But then, yeah, I think since she mostly works under, I think probably under NDA, it's probably not a whole lot of art, but a lot more personal posting. So, yeah. what is something personal that you know about her that she's shared online? Uh well, she talks a bit about her family and about sort of her interest in history and um, different artistic influences and stuff. So that's definitely part of it. Yeah. And I'd love everybody here right in the chat. Who is somebody you follow online who no matter what they do, you will watch it. Okay. And ask yourself, why is that the case? So for example, the person for me is David Lovovitz. He's an American chef. He lives in Paris and he just pumps out so much stuff. And you know something? I read every single thing. Now, every single thing he puts out is not the best thing ever. This is good advice for Tamara. But I'm like, David Lovovitz wrote it. I'm interested. And that's the difference between having a following and just showing people your work. Because um, I know at ArtProf, we have a fairly big following. People have been following us for years. And a lot of people trust me. So if I say, hey, this brush sucks, they'll go, oh, Clara thinks it sucks. Maybe it's not so great. But if I don't do any of that, if I just show my work, there's no opportunity for people to really trust me. And that's important in terms of selling, in terms of the work that you share. So what you'll find oftentimes is the way we behave online as a follower to somebody else does not align with what we're doing as artists and then we look at we're like oh yeah i do really like it when i see a photo of the artist tell me in the chat 
Who here, when you find a new artist, you really like them? Who here, when you find a photo of the artist, it makes a difference? Or tell me if it doesn't. For me, it does, because I'm like, oh, wow, you're a real person. <laughs> so, um, Taylor, I would think about that because you've got great work. Your work is so diverse and clearly producing a lot is not a problem for you. But I think it's the organization we need to get at. Uh, definitely. Thank you very much. Cool. All right, everybody, we're going to take a five minute break. Go do some stretches. And of course, you can hang out in the chat if you want to type some things. I might do that myself. But scrolling back into the chat, I'm very glad to see that people are commenting on each other's things and tell each other what's hard, what's not. Because I think it was Jack who was saying that um, he doesn't have a lot of people to talk to about social media and this is your chance because yeah a lot of people don't want to do it because it's like oh, i don't want to admit it's hard guess what it's hard <laughs> if it's not hard you're doing something wrong <laughs> so i would definitely keep that in mind yeah okay cool five minutes everybody be back
everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. I didn't change anything. So yeah, everybody <laughs> move over to workshop test. So that way we don't lose the text and all the chatting. So my apologies. So I'm just going to type this here. Everyone type here for the rest of the session. Okay. Hopefully everybody's seeing that. Let me just double check on voice. There's the chat. Okay. So I'll write it one more time. Everybody go to workshop test. Okay. Sorry, I, I must have done something with the settings. I had no idea that was going to be the case. Okay, great, fantastic. All right, let's take a look at Gaz. So Gaz, can you hop on voice? Yep, hello. Hey, all right. So give us the quick overview because I was noting earlier in the chat, we have miniature artist and illustrator, Providence Home Portraiture, Stop motion, 3D, and 2D. I confess I am confused about what you do, Gaz. Okay, yeah, I can I can see that. Um, I, I think it just really came down to uh, deciding. It, it's hard to limit myself because I really do do both things. I'm a multi-faceted uh, artist. Like, I, I just kind of, I learned with 2D, and I came into RISD expecting to leave doing 2D, and then I found Spatial Dynamics first year, and uh, I was like, wow, hold on a second, this is really cool. So, I mean, from there, I really started focusing on miniature art, but it felt complete, it, it just felt wrong to say that, like, that's the only thing I do. So, I, I, because I was still a really strong 2D artist. So I, I kind of have my site split up into just uh, three categories. They get, they go from 2D and then 3D and then 4D technically or stop motion, which is just any video work that I had at the time. But um, yeah, I, I would like to continue advertising myself as both because I love doing both kinds of art. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, marketing and deciding how to post from one day to the next and have it seem like the same artist, that is kind of difficult as of right now. It's very difficult, but you can do it. <laughs> it's just a matter of having a plan, I think um, a lot of people don't realize that you almost have to make rules for yourself, kind of like what I was talking to Tegan about, hey, decide in advance. I'm not going to show anything about my parents or I'm always going to show off my guinea pig. You have to make rules for yourself. And so maybe what you need to do, guys, is step back and say, okay, what does go on my Instagram? What is not on my website? Because when we were building artprof.org, the web developer said to me, Clara, do you have to put everything on the website? I was like, oh, I guess I don't need to because we have too much content. And if I put everything we have on the website, oh my God, people would just die. There would be no rhyme or reason to how that happens. Yeah. So can you tell me where Providence Home Portraiture fits? Because that's not on your website. Um, it, well, it kind of is. It's in a subcategory of 2D. It's something that I started doing and haven't really posted about on Instagram yet. But um, I, it's uh, right there under houses. I, I basically, I enjoy drawing these houses and I started doing it in Providence. Um, and I figured that it's a pretty nice, marketable kind of business that I could get into. It's a niche. Uh, I don't expect to do it all the time. It's certainly not the only thing I'd be doing. But that's kind of what commissions are open for. I went around Providence and hung flyers everywhere and I got that color commission mm -hmm. from doing that, the mm -hmm. first image that's there. So yeah, that was someone's house and um, uh, they they paid me to do a portrait. I'm currently working on a second one for um, Jeff's Superlative Sandwiches in um, in Providence, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you know them. But um, yeah, they're also paying me to draw their business. And so it, yeah, it's it's, just something that I really like doing as far as 2D art goes. Right now, it's been something that I've been marketing myself for since leaving RISD. Got it. Okay, so one thing you can do is across platforms, if it's the same work, name it the same thing. Because on your website, it's called houses. And I just think, oh, it's houses, right? But then here you say yes. Providence Home Portraiture. That is extremely specific. It's so different mm -hmm. than, quote, houses. And so if you want this to make sense to an audience going between your social media and 
website, you got to pick one. Is it going to be Providence Home Portraiture or is it going to be Houses? Because that in yeah. itself is confusing the inconsistency. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And same thing with the other language. Like you have 3D here, but then it says miniature artist. So you just have to make sure all the wording corresponds because people will do both. They'll go to your website, look at your stuff, then they'll go to your Instagram. And, and right now it really does look like two different artists because if I start up here and I look at what's on the front page and then I go here, I'm like, who is this? And so it's nothing to do with your work. Like you've got fantastic work that I think is diverse and wonderful, but it's like, I'm going somewhere and you're trying to give me directions. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like I turned left where you said turn right. And <laughs> it's just very confusing. So you have to create a roadmap and really make sure everything lines up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Now looking at your website so the question is how do you reconcile being such a diverse artist but not making your audience crazy feeling like they're being pulled in different directions so well, i kind of oh mm -hmm. you I, I kind of think that that was like the design that i was going for with this site of just doing three simple categories and they kind of just get they get more 3d or more it's literally 2d 3d 4d it's kind of like you know three categories and i think that if you go to my site for my 3D stuff, you kind of know where to go. If you go for my drawings or anything 2D, it's like, I kind of think that that's as much as I could subcategorize it. And, uh, but yeah, I'm open to suggestions. Okay, so let's take a look at this page on your website. Okay, let's pretend I'm not looking at the title. Technically, this page is called 3D, okay? But if I look at these, I mean, these look like book covers to me. I, I could be wrong. But do you see how these three images, they don't look like they fit with these three. It's like, why are these images that look like book covers, why are they the same page as this? Like that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then here, this almost seems like a totally different thing because you're calling this 3D, but it could be the photo. It just looks like miniature paintings. And then this yeah. is not as 3D, like these are more reliefs than they are, say, full out sculpture, like you have here with the juggler. And so a lot of this is changing the names, but also asking, like, do these really fit together? Because visually they don't. Okay. And then if we go into 2D, okay, we have houses, midnight curiosities. Okay. Now, are these a series called because um, Midnight Curiosities? Because it's a little all over the place. You've got black and white, you've got paintings. This looks like a podcast illustration. So I'm not convinced yeah. that these fit together. Um, yeah, I kind of just divided it into mainly color uh, and, and black and white. There is one color image in there because it was kind of darker subject matter. So I put it with those things. I think I was just going for... Um, the different types of art that I do, uh, I kind of, it, it's strange. I think my earlier art, I was leaning more towards spooky, scary stuff because it's easy. It's like, you know, shock art kind of has had its appeal for a while, but now as I've gotten more mature, I like, I enjoy more wondrous things or kind of like inspiring, genuine awe or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, something beautiful over something that's simply scary. So, um, yeah, I think Worlds in Color is just my color illustrations, whatever medium they are, and then Houses has its own category. Okay, this makes sense now. So I, I think what's confusing about this is when I read something, Midnight Curiosities, that sounds like a body of work. It's like, oh, it's a book, it's named Midnight Curiosities, here are all the illustrations. Same thing with Worlds okay. in Color, that sounds like a project. But what you're really saying, this is color illustration, this is black and white illustration. And so unless yeah. the name, unless it's really like the name of a project, you don't want to put everything under Midnight Curiosities because I go in here thinking, oh, this is a project. And then I'm like, what? Why is everything so disparate? So it, it really is an organizational issue because I think um, what's tricky about your sites right now is that you're not sort of controlling the way the content is being looked at. 
and that's an organizational thing and you making decisions about what goes where. So tell me, what is your approach on Instagram? How do you choose what to share? Oh, I share whatever I have the bravery to. <laughs> I really just like whenever if I if I really work myself up into a pitch where I can I can post something and I tend to do it. And it's kind of just like if I finish something and I'm really proud of it. And uh, that also really does count against me in some places because, you know, I'll post with really high hopes almost all the time and then never get any result. And so it's just kind of like continuously discouraging. Right. But um the, but yeah, if I'm really proud of something or if I finish something, it's big. I realize I haven't posted in months, then I kind of throw it up there. So that's why it's out of order. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't, I think only consistent, post, consistent posting in the future is going to rectify that. Or, I mean, a main question I want to ask is, should I just have two accounts for 2D and 3D stuff? Because that would stop my work from mixing so much. Well, see, here's the thing. Your social media is not the same as your website, okay? Think about it this way. Your website is the opposite of your Instagram. So a website is like you're having your museum retrospective. Everything's labeled. Everything's nice and neat and hung up on the wall. It's curated. You're not showing works in progress and sketches. Social media is the opposite. It's just behind the scenes. Like, you know, when you watch these documentaries on movies, I mean, for me, it was the Lord of the Rings had this incredible behind the scenes documentary. And we love that. I mean, most of us eat that up. So why do we like seeing the mess? Can you guess why, Gaz? Because uh, it's relatable and no, no one's perfect. You could see that for once. People like that. And I think that you telling yourself, I have to be proud of it to post it. That's a huge limitation because, you know, I get a lot of people, I'll post like a, like absolute crap thing. And I'll say, this is crap. I hate it. It stinks. Here's why, blah, 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 blah. And yet people really relate to those posts. And so by putting yourself out there and not worrying about, is this good enough to share? It, it just makes things less precious because it's almost like you're doing three paintings and you want them to be perfect. But the consequence is you feel so uncomfortable sharing it because you are precious about it. And you could try in your stories, if you're worried about it, some quick sloppy stuff because you're curating yourself so heavily that we're missing out. I mean, you make these beautiful miniatures. Like, I want to see your tools. I want to see the mess. And that helps me relate to you as a person. Yeah, I think it's also hard because I, I think the thing I find hardest about it is taking a break to document things. Because when I work on miniatures especially, I will work for six hours straight and make a lot of progress on something and realize that I haven't stopped to take a photo once because like, I'm in a fever pitch of just working on something. Sure. And it's not, even when I set out with like, okay, I'm going to document some of this or I got to take some progress. I'm like, eh, let me just fix that post first. And then I fix the post and it's six hours later. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh shit, I made the entire mailbox without taking an entire, with uh, taking one photo of the goddamn thing. So that's like, that is very frustrating. And I just need to stop and breathe every once in a while, especially while I'm working and document things. Cause that, yeah, uh, work in progress is like, it's just it's a mess for me because uh i mean also while i'm working so intensely i'm like cutting a piece of wood and then just throwing it somewhere on my desk and like eventually my desk just becomes this horrifying mess with the things i'm working on like very carefully laid out in it and so taking a photo of that is never appealing it's not attractive like i can't make my workspace with with uh cups of water and and candies that i'm <laughs> eating like i can't make it look good i no matter what i do so i really like Stopping to take those photos is a whole effort for me. I just have to move all this stuff aside and make it look picturesque for one second so that I can get back to throwing things together. Why do you want to show such a sanitized version of your studio space? How do you think you would gain from that versus just, here are all my crappy coffee cups, which we all have? It's not, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I yeah I just don't have the uh, confidence I, I you've been saying you've been posting a lot of stuff that that is just like oh everyone has a messy desk and yeah that's like totally true but at the same time I it's like it's simply just getting a good photo of it like just no photo that I take is is really looks good to me <laughs> it's, when that stuff is in it and so like it just it, it just gets really hard 
Um, I think you need to stop being such a perfectionist. <laughs> I should yeah. take my own advice. But right now, it's, it's almost paralyzing. So there's a couple of things I'm going to recommend. The first thing is, yes, it is extremely disruptive to have to stop and take those work in progress images. So this is what you do. You actually fake some of the footage. So I sent some of yeah. you the um, short where I was drawing the tree. So there are a couple yeah. of clips where it's my face looking up and down. Guess what? Those clips, I fake them. I was not drawing <laughs> when I did that. I just filmed myself looking up and down, put them in, and it looks like I'm looking and drawing at the same time. I'm not, though. And then the other thing that I do is I take breaks. I'm assuming within a five-hour chunk, you get a drink or something, correct? Yes. Okay, yeah, so when constantly. you get up to get that drink, that's when you take a whole bunch of photos. And you take a lot. You take like 40, okay? And within one mess, let's say your desk, you probably could get 30 photos out of that, okay? When you've taken photos of your stuff, how many do you usually take? Oh, it depends. There's a lot. Like sometimes when I have 3D things, I, I end up spamming and taking a lot of them because I move around the angles and I, I take things from every different angle and I put multiples together and I try and get a better background. Yeah, and different lighting. Like it, when it comes to that stuff, I do really fill up my phone. Uh, but I just I just don't post frequently enough is really the problem. It it takes it's it's a, a big source of anxiety for me. So I I just it, I really have to work myself into wanting to post online anymore. So it it sounds like to me the issue is more this um, mental hurdle that you have to get over to put the stuff out there, and and really you guys that whole fake it till you make it thing it actually works it really does because you can have spectacular work, but if you don't present yourself with confidence, people aren't gonna come along. Like you have to believe in what you're doing. And so you have to find a way to take photos that you do like, because I'll tell you when I started doing shorts, I mean, I rolled my eyes. I was like, oh, shorts, I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna learn other things, it's so annoying. I don't wanna be on TikTok. But the thing is people can tell when you don't wanna be there. And I feel like that's what I'm seeing on your Instagram is you're treating it more like a website gallery. And I feel like you don't want to be here. So you have to find a way to make it fun. And I don't know what that way is, but you have to get into some kind of workflow because um, I, I'm guessing from what you're explaining and looking at your sites that you kind of look at Instagram as, oh, I have to do it. Is that accurate or am I way off? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think honestly, I've I've had some I I have only posted like those two reels of me in process, and that's actually kind of like that for me. That's that's a lot of forward momentum. One great. of them got like a decent amount of views, and it's kind of because you know I did what you're supposed to do. Um, I like I I just took videos of me working and stuff. I I kind of compiled all of the scarce images I had from making that one project into a video. And that ended up working out. I it wasn't as stressful for me. I just have to do it more. I think. Yeah. Because uh, honestly, reels do kind of present a good opportunity. Uh, at the same time that you know this isn't particularly advantageous to a lot of people, but like, uh, I I like I like music, and I've always kind of wanted a way to pair music and art yeah. together. Reels actually do provide that opportunity, so it's something that like. Oh, you know what? If I really just kind of like do enough of these and get into it, I could I could start uh, uh, getting more into reels for that reason. Here's what I think, guys. I think you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you just have to decide that I'm going to embrace this. I'm not going to see it as a drag because you know what? People can feel that. They can tell when you are not having fun. I mean, I've done some really just stupid things online and yeah, academia clara would have been like oh you can't sell your soul like that but i'm like dude i'm having fun okay you may think it's stupid but i'm 46 and i don't care so you know you can wait till you're 46 and don't care <laughs> because that will happen but i i think you have to find a way to make this fun for yourself because i see you sort of dragging your feet with the sites yeah all right great yeah, exactly. thank you gaz and how about let's move to Franco. So Franco, how about you hop on voice and get us started with what we're looking at. Hey, how's it going? 
um yeah so this is my instagram i post a lot of stuff i do a lot of editorial work so a lot of it is for newspapers and magazines and most of the time i'm posting final work but in the past like months or so i've tried to start incorporating more process um i have it used to be posts that were more like here are my thumbnails here are my sketches and i talk a little bit about them and i'm slowly starting to experiment with reels and seeing how that goes um but that's a big bulk of what i do it's kind of funny scrolling down because there's a lot of just changes in the way that i've worked that have happened throughout the years so it's a bit all over the place and i'm hoping that eventually start to like settle down as i keep going great and then franco what are your goals as far as selling work i know you do a lot of freelance work but what about the selling is it prints is it merch is it originals yeah um so i honestly like the way i started the store that i have now was kind of just I felt like I needed some sort of platform where people could get stuff if they wanted. And I just made it kind of like a project for myself to design kind of an apparel line that I wanted to wear or things that I really liked. And it became this thing of just doing that. And then I added other prints. But now it's something that I, you know, it's getting a little bit outdated in the way that I work and I'm enjoying how I'm working now. So I'm thinking either making another line of things, but mostly I think I want to focus on a good setup for prints and i don't really know if having uh, a platform with another website that does the, the it's basically all outsourced um is convenient or like price uh sensible for me to do because i think my experience with it is that it's it keeps climbing in price sure. over time and there's a lot of products that i'm like i'm not selling that much of these and what i would like to be selling are not really um, giving me enough revenue or there might be other platforms that have better quality for this and could just be more profitable for me in the long run. So uh, that's something that I'm kind of struggling with and thinking about. Sure. Now, these photos that you have of, let's say, the hands holding the prints, is that generated by your platform? Yeah, they're, they're generated by the platform. Okay. I really would not recommend doing that because there's all these apps now where you can say, okay, here's my big acrylic painting. Here's what it would look like in somebody's living room, okay? I understand the impulse to wanna to show that, but I can spot that a mile away. Like it, it looks so fake and, and quite frankly, very cold. And same thing with these images up here. Are these actual models that you took photos of? No, I wish I had that many hot friends to <laughs> I have a lot of hot friends, but I think these are like, you know, they know what they're doing. So but yeah, it would it would be more genuine. I agree with to have like your own. I don't really know if there's a way to do it even through this platform to have your own mock ups, but I, see. I think it would look much better, yeah. Well, so one thing that I'm seeing on this site, you're taking one design, let's say the yellow flowers here and you are just mm. sticking it on everything. And that gets very boring very fast. And honestly, once I realize after looking at a few rows that that's what you're doing, I turn off. I don't really care. And the reason why is because it's almost like you've minimized your design by just slapping it on everything because there are some patterns that look terrible. <laughs> that's a tote bag, but oh, they look so good as a scarf. And I think it's not doing you any favors right now to have so many items, but only have like four flower designs. You would be better off having, let's say eight items instead of say 16, where the design feels a little bit more special. Um, because the problem with this, it is so easy to do. We can just upload this design, say, okay, merch, mug, this, this, and this, but it's, not helping you because the designs don't feel special anymore they feel like they're just thrown on yeah i definitely had it's moments struggling like which ones to pick because there would be people that at the end of the day like i was making these and i think it was a lot for the people that wanted them you know i made it mostly for fun for me but then people would say like oh i want like you know a hoodie of this or can you put this on a short or something and i'm like yeah sure i'll put it on and then it does become a thing of like 
okay, they go on everything. But I also agree that not all of them look, you know, as well as the others. So they just kind of linger there, but they don't really show the best features of each design. Right. You know, I'm looking at this cow print. I think this would be a great shirt. <laughs> and, you know, it's good as yeah. a print as well. But I think that, I mean, I know this is not a critique of the items, but like a lot of these floral patterns don't look that great, but they look good as tote bags. And that cow print might be really cool as a dress. I mean, that would be such a funny design on a dress. And so you just have to make sure you're not watering down your designs. You want them to feel more unique because I do think people are looking for that. Okay, and this is your sketchbook. And so are you thinking about just ditching the merch stuff altogether? No, I think I just kind of want to, I don't want to ditch it altogether, but I think I do want to think it holistically going forward. I think it's already helpful to think about it in the way that you're mentioning about things that I have not included in some of the apparel stuff. Uh, that being said, it's like, I don't know how much I will continue doing you know, apparel with this line, because again, I think with Printful in particular, I've just been having my own struggles with the prices climbing and the sure. profits that I get from it. So I think it is something that, you know, if I do end up doing merch, it could be something that I want to print it by myself. Like if I just do totes uh, and do like uh, linoleum cuts and print it myself, I think that could be really fun and add another layer of kind of materiality to it. Um, right those are kind of things that I'm still experimenting with and seeing if it's viable for me to have my own stock of things because it does get really inconvenient to have the inventory. Have you ever made a design knowing in advance it was going to be a t-shirt? Uh, the flowers were all kind of with that intention, but they started getting kind of gimmicky at one point. I think some of them worked better than others and the others were just kind of made to fit. Okay. You know? Because even as a sketch, you said that you do lino blocks, right? Yeah, I've tried it like recently and I had a lot of fun with it. So I was like, maybe I could do some more like that with the kind of work that I want to do next. So I think it'd be really fun. Well, I think what you could do is just get a cheap shirt and just get some linoleum blocks and just mess with it, <laughs> the physical t-shirt. Yeah. And then you look at the t-shirt and you say, oh, that would look really good in this way and then you could say scan your linoleum blocks and then arrange them in a way that fits because i think it is a problem to do something as a piece of apparel and not think about the form of that apparel think about the silhouette that happens because it's all very much related okay now franco can you tell us what have some of your frustrations been in terms of selling your work or any of your sites um I think mostly like, I don't know, the, the price is above all like something that I think about a lot. Like I think some of the pricings for the merch and stuff, it's not crazy in terms of like, you know, what some people pay for shirts and sweatshirts and whatnot. It's just the thought of like the type of quality that you get. It's not like going to a store and buying a shirt and buying something. Right. It's a little bit lower. So, so it's, it's, it doesn't quite match that. And I think there's that frustration aside from that i mean i think it's been smooth in terms of the process of being able to have that being outsourced and just have someone else kind of manufacture and ship everything mm -hmm. um but then i guess that like the, the other question of just like you know if you think about doing tabling in the future like that's another type of selling that i think about that i've never tried before but I would need inventory for. So it's almost like, do you start a shop already and start it with inventory and then use yeah. that same inventory for tabling? So it's a little bit of a crossover that I don't know if I'm there and convinced that I want to take that leap, but it is like an option that's floating. Uh, are you really concerned about your prices and worrying about, oh, they're too high, people won't buy it? I, I think most of the time, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pricing is really hard for a lot of people. This may sound silly, but it's very emotional. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, a number? I have to put this, slap it onto my painting. And yeah. I'd love for people to say yeah. in the chat if pricing drives you crazy, because it sure does drive me crazy. 
I think that's something that it's like, there's definitely something psychological in it that I'm like, I always try to shoot for higher, but then I'm also critical of my own stuff. Like I think anybody, so you see and you're like, yeah, but the quality is not quite there or this print is a little bit off or not as saturated as I want it to be. So all those little things kind of like, I think add up in a way that is not conducive to really getting the right value for your stuff. Well, you have to think about it in the mindset of a customer. So for example, my kid loves the Beatles, is totally obsessed with them, okay? And we went to the antique store the other day and she found this telephone. It, it was a telephone, but it was a salt and pepper shaker, but it had like the yellow submarine fish on it. And she mm -hmm. saw that thing and said, I don't care what it costs, we're getting that. And so the thing is, I mean, for a little piece of ceramic, I mean, it kind of was a higher price. It was like $50. And I was like, what? And she was like, no, 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 we have to have this. I mean, granted, it's not her money. But yeah. I think when people want to buy something, it's like they're either really determined or it's like, nope, don't want to do it. And I'm the same way, too. Like when I go to a flea market and let's say I'm buying a gift for my child, I either like don't care or I'm like, that's what I want. And so the yeah. thing is, when you want something really bad, you kind of don't fret that much about the price. Of course, it depends on everybody. But um, I think you'll find, Franco, that um, when people want something, they'll put up the money if they have it. And so actually yeah. by making your prices low, sometimes it makes people think, oh, well, this is only $20. It must not be very good quality. Like you ever go shop for something on say Amazon and it's like, okay, there are these two speakers. Okay, they seem so similar, but one is $50 more. Doesn't that make you think, oh, the one that's more expensive, it must somehow be better. Yeah, I hate that it does, but it does. It does though. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and the thing is sometimes it, there really is no difference. It's like one dumb thing that doesn't matter, but I'll tell you it works on me every time. I'm always like, oh, I should get the more expensive one. And it's not because I look at it and say, oh, this one's prettier. It's like mm. that number makes me think feel like I can trust that object more than the other one. Yeah, I, I guess another question that comes up with that too is kind of what you brought up and mentioned about when, when people really want something, it's like gauging how to make a product or make something that you know people are really going to want or have an inkling that they're really going to want it. And so far, like at least for the last, you know, line that I made of stuff, it was very much kind of guided on, I just think I would really want this and try to go through there. And I think it worked for me to at least get it done and up because it made me really excited about wanting to share it. But I, that's something that I think about too, you know, because I'm not super inclined to, um, I know one, one way to kind of jump into it and practice too with a store and way of making merch that really works is sometimes you know, responding to either a show that you really like or a series that you really like and making work around that because you know that there's already kind of like a fan base for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not super inclined to do that, but mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, one thing to think about of kind of like how to create something new that maybe has the potential for people to really like it. Here's what I think, Franco. You should make what you want to make and you will find people who want to buy it because I think from this very short conversation we're having, it seems to me like you're trying too hard to predict what will people like, what is the right price? It, there's no correct answer. I mean, look at the stuff people yeah. pay for. I mean, it's look at the contemporary art world. It's like, oh, I threw some tomatoes on the wall. This is $5,000. It's like people will pay for anything. Somebody bought that freaking banana taped on a duct tape to the wall for a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars or whatever amount it was and i mean do i think that that's valuable no but clearly right, somebody right. convinced somebody it was and so you have to stop worrying about oh is the work good will people like it? don't don't do that just make what you like and you will find that audience because guess what i really like guinea pigs because i have four Okay, chances are there are other people nice. in the world that like <laughs> guinea pigs. And so let's say I just want to draw guinea pigs all day. There are going to be people that buy it because they also like guinea pigs. Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that's something like, I, I think over the years of getting more confident just being like, yeah, I really want to draw this. Like I really wanted to draw just a bunch of flowers and be like, I wanted a shirt that looks like this and feels like this. And that was like 
a great incentive to get there. And now things have shifted and kind of like I keep thinking of new stuff. But um, yeah, I think it's a really cool kind of way to think it. Yeah, and, and one theme we're seeing with almost everybody here is that a lot of this is in your mind. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but it's like, it's almost like we create hurdles for ourselves. And it's like, you have to take away that hurdle. And for a lot of people, it's confidence. It's like, oh, who am I to put that out there? But, you know, there's a lot of people, they just go out there and say, hey, you should listen to me. And we all go, oh, really? Oh, I guess I should. You know, and it's like kind of annoying because sometimes those people, you see them doing that and commanding um, a presence. And you're like, why does everybody listen to this person? They have stupid ideas. That's true. There are a lot of people out there mm -hmm. who people really care what they say, but what they say is actually not that intelligent. And then those people are very intelligent, but nobody listens to them. And I, I have mm -hmm. to say, so much of it is confidence. You just have to say, hey, this is my thing. Deal with it. It's hard. It takes time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Okay. Let's move on and take a look at Jack's sites. So Jack, how about you hop on voice? Hello. Hey. All right, Jack. So you've got a lot of illustration. We talked about some of your 3D pieces. We talked about the inflatable castle. And what is your goal for selling your work? Um, my goal for selling my work is more of getting my name out there and meet more people in real life instead of just um, being this fake person online <laughs> and you don't really see all the time. Right. Um, I most thing I love was about um, for selling artwork in local sales is to meet like your followers or your fans or your. Uh, the people that pay attention to your socials uh, in person and to get that love directly uh, in in the reality. Uh, same thing with gallery and same thing with, uh, yeah, I just want to see um, that interaction between humans uh, happening in physical space rather than you know, on the internet. Okay, um, so would you yeah. say that for you, it's less about the selling and more about just connecting with people. Is that more what it is? Yes. Well, there is a certain part of it definitely wants uh, more. Um, I guess. Uh, I guess more more connections online uh, through more physical activities. But mainly, I would say it's just uh, our social interactions. And okay. And tell me, what's been your experience selling? Have you tabled at an art fair? Have you had an online shop or anything like that? I never had an online shop. I thought about it, but with the same situation with Tom Tamara and many other people's, uh, haven't really decided or committed to a uh, solution. So I only do local fairs, physical local fairs. Um, and those experiences are amazing. Uh, I've been I've done about four or five, which is not a lot, but uh, starting last year is actually, um, last year this around this time is actually the first time to do a local sell. Mm -hmm. And one thing I realized is I began to see returning customers mm -hmm. who didn't had regret, didn't regret that they did not purchase a print, sure. for example, and they want to come back and to uh, buy all of them. And so like, and I didn't, I, you wouldn't get that, I would say, from online. Uh, it's just people that you have no idea who they are. Yep. Uh, learn who you are through just seeing your work in physical space. And then they came back and get more. So it's just, uh, I don't know. I feel like we're living in a really digital, digitized world these days. And sometimes simple things like like this became really emotional it's almost sad <laughs> yeah oh what do you mean by that um it's well we, like we all grown up uh i guess we all come from like a really academic background mm -hmm. from a lot of art and design schools and the thing we talk about art and design i feel like is really based on 
a creator's perspective and point of view. Um, and we don't really interact with our consumers or audience that often, to right. be honest. And once we are actually in context, like a physical context with them, you receive love, you receive expressions from your audience facing a gallery, you receive actual money, you receive uh, warm support from an action of people looking at your art for a long time and decide to buy them. All these little details are missing from websites, Instagram, and all sorts of that. I think that's why I love specifically only attend to physical art sales. Okay. Because for me, I think that means more to me than um, the actual incomes and uh, I guess my following members, to be honest. Okay. It's yeah. so helpful to hear that, Jack, because I'll say that based on your social media that I would never have guessed that was the case. Your Instagram, it, it's similar to what we talked to Tegan and Gaz and a bunch of other people about, that there's just so much just finished work. And it sounds to me like you're really interested in interactions, real life interactions and appreciating people and meeting them. Is that right or am I way off? Um, I do want to meet people in real life. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that I deleted my Instagram account. I mean, the account is still there, but I think I deleted it. I don't want to try to have some sort of a social media cleansing. I do agree that uh, the same comments we made on the previous artists. Um, I have issues to um, present something that is unfinished or unpolished. Uh, but again, I feel like I'm at the stage I need to be somewhat professional and uh, I'm trying to break in the bond as you can see some of the photos I just don't give and I just want to send a picture of it uh, that took from my phone and sometimes I want to uh, post more, as you mentioned, my face. Like mm -hmm. uh, even though it's a group picture, but it's like my way of approaching uh, to the level that I'm comfortable just sending them uh, day to day life of me in real life pictures. Um, so that is still a process of doing. Yeah. I think it'd be very interesting for everybody here to do that post that you don't want to do. Do a post of that crappy sketch, Owen, that you said you're so embarrassed by that sketch. Post it explain why you don't like it and just see because you know what I see a lot is people sort of get into these patterns and they just keep doing the same thing over and over again and in your Instagram like a lot of the other ones we've seen today it's the exact same post finish artwork nothing else okay you have a couple that break it up like the bouncy house some pictures of you down here but it is pretty much the same pattern it's like those time lapses is exactly the same. It's like, okay, there's Sarah posting the exact same time lapse that I've seen from them 1500 times. And so a lot of this is trial and error. Um, is there a reason, Jack, you haven't wanted to step outside of this format that you have? Uh, well, as I said, uh, I actually don't feel uncomfortable to post my pictures of myself. Uh, I actually used to post it a lot. Um, it's mainly because I separate my private Instagram and my art Instagram. Yeah. So I have a place to just send, pick, post whatever I want. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that pattern is pre-website pattern. So like now I have a website, I have a more curated um, platform that I don't have to be so curated on my Instagram, I can just post whatever. But because of my followers, um, I think the, this whole context of using Instagram and constantly watched, I think I still have some unconsciousness of posting things that are more presentable. Uh, so I am trying to break that down and, uh, and step, up out, step that part out. But like I feel mainly the issue for me is that I take in things really seriously all the time yeah. and I don't loosen up that often. So I think every post should has its own meaning, but it doesn't really have to have a meaning. No. Uh, it can just be some. It can just be really free and relaxing, whatever you want. But 
I guess that's one of the issue that I'm not uh, ready to confront and don't need to confront right now. That's why I feel like I need to take a break from the platform as well. Right. So my recommendation, first of all, a lot of people have that. Like I have a private account that nobody knows about. Don't advertise it. It's just for my family. Okay. And what you might try doing is go through your private personal account and say, okay, what is a post I did here that I could put on my professional public Instagram that I would be okay sharing? There are some pictures, mm. absolutely, I'm not sharing this, okay? There's other stuff where like, you know what, that'd be okay for some people to see that. And give it a shot because I think what you said earlier about taking yourself too seriously, I think that's a very good observation that you've made because a lot of the stuff we're attracted to online is not that serious. And a lot of the stuff mm. that is serious is boring. <laughs> you know, like, do I have right. to watch another professor in a tweed suit who's a, you know, somebody who's not speaking that well? And, you know, it's like, yeah, they're talking about this, oh, complicated data about this, this, and this. But it's like, if they can't hold my attention, that's really bad. In fact, I had this experience. I got to see Eric Fischel lecture when I was in New York City. And I mean, Eric Fischel is, he's it. I mean, he's in the art history books. He's one of my favorite artists, okay? I mean, you, I was so happy to hear him speak, okay? I go to the lecture, oh my God, he is the most monotonous speaker. So I'm here, I, I love his work. Guess what, I fell asleep because I, I couldn't stay awake. <laughs> and then there was Will Cotton, who, to be honest, he's not really my favorite artist. His work is fine, but he's not really my cup of tea. He was such a good speaker that actually after the lecture, I was like, wow, I need to take a closer look at his work because he was so engaging. And so that's where there is this divide between like, okay, you have the work, but then you also have the person and they have to come together. You can't just say, this is my artwork, that's it. At least if you wanna be that way in social media. That's what social media is all about. You have to engage with a person you don't just engage with artwork. So um, yeah, if you can find a way to loosen up, do you, do you feel like there's a reason you have hesitation? Is it sort of like what other people said about confidence and worrying the work isn't perfect enough? I don't, I I view myself more like a clown. So like, I really don't like have that vulnerability, but it's because of like, I think the story exists and so popular these days. So I mainly post everything about my life on my story instead of my posts. I think because a uh, story is temporary and uh, posts have real states almost, like it's a permanent real state. So I feel something that is more life related about my daily -day life, it's more easier to record it on just story and then share it. Um, and people can see it whenever, whenever they want. Uh, but for the post, I think it should be more grounded and somewhat, uh, somewhat more like i guess art related and uh I, i'm still trying to find a balance because i feel like because i separate a uh, story and um post so uh strictly that i can like to like i use use these for their specific reasons um yeah well so what i would consider is there should be a little crossover i mean i do sort of the same thing like i put stuff on my instagram stories that is just stupid it's like hey i found this mushroom <laughs> you should all care right you know i do stuff like that i would not put that into a post but what i want you to consider is let's say i don't know if you have interest in being published do you as an illustrator uh not currently okay because i'm actually working um in a design company right now so okay. like uh like yeah but i wish I, I i hope one day i can be published uh yeah what would you publish? Would it be like a graphic novel or a children's book or? It will be more of a children's book, but more like an artist's book uh, and a graphic novel as well. Got it. Yeah. Okay, now let's pretend, Jack, somehow a publisher came across your Instagram, okay? This is their very first impression. They don't know anything about you other than, oh, they saw somebody reposted your stuff, they got interested. Okay, so now right. they're here, they're looking at your profile. Okay, if they know nothing about you, that is the perspective all of you need to take with your sites. Somebody landed on this page, they don't know anything about me. 
Because I think what happens is when you post things and you don't contextualize them for people, it feels like an inside joke that I'm not a part of and it makes me not right. want to hang out. And so when you explain things better and you show us who you are, like if I was the publisher and I came here and you see this group photo, there's like five people. You know what my first impression is? Which one's you? I have no idea. Right. <laughs> like I can't tell. And I have to scroll, wait, and same here. This is another group photo. I'm like, which one is you? It's not until I get here that I realize, oh, that's what you look like, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think what's happening is you're treating your account almost like it's only being followed by people that know you. They, they already have a history of who you are, but you have right. to be prepared for people who know nothing about you, for them to get a taste of it and to entice them enough that they are going to email you to say, here's the book deal. I understand. Yeah. Because the thing is, you've got tons of work. I mean, a lot of people we're looking at here have tons of work. That is not the problem. The problem is, how are you going to get me to stay here? And one of the right. things about your website is that it's pretty sparse. For example, if I go to About, you just tell us, this is Jack, I was born in Hangzhou, China, this is my website, that's it. So after I read this, I go, okay, good, I'm leaving. <laughs> you don't give me a reason to want to stick around. And that's the same thing with a shop. If somebody has five items in an online shop, people leave because it's like, there's not much to look at. Let's say you have 200 items in your online shop. People will stay because they'll say, oh, there's these different categories. This person has illustrations, they have zines, they have prints. There's enough for me to look at. And a lot of your sites right now, it's just lacking content. Like, I want to know about who you are. If you just tell me, this is my website, I'm like, yes, I know, I'm on your website. Yes, I know your name is Jack. The only thing I learn about you on this page is that you're, you were born in Hangzhou, China. That's it. So you need to give us more to sink our teeth into. Make us want to read more about you. Yeah, I... I feel like the reason why I did that is because, um, first of all, I feel there is a sense of humor to it, and I hope people can get that because it's obviously really ridiculous for me just to say I'm from Hangzhou, China, and this is my website. Obviously, it's a really obvious and blunt thing to say, um, and I want some reason to trigger people to not stay on this page for a really long time and uh if they're really interested in my work if they can connect me through my social media which is also linked on there or email um and i like to for my website to have a certain amount of privacy because i feel uh website is something that people can everyone can access to and uh, a lot of people put a lot of their private information or their face on the website that i feel um i just personally don't um like resonate with that um Right now, I feel like if you really want to know, uh, you can connect me on Instagram or email me directly for a business interest or opportunities. Uh, I don't know if that's that mindset is like correct right now, but that's how I feel comfortable currently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you don't want to do anything that makes you deeply uncomfortable, of course. But I can right. tell you from an old fart point of view, and a lot of these publishers are old farts, we don't get it. Right. <laughs> I look at this and I'm sure, you know, it's sort of like my kids and their cousins, they, they just crack up over stuff they see online and they show it to me. I'm like, what's funny? I don't get it. They're like, see, we knew you weren't going to get it. That's what this is. Because if I'm a publisher, I don't want to understand your generation's sense of humor. I'm sorry to sound right. like an old fart, but that is the perspective. I want to know if I'm a publisher, hey, is this person look trustworthy? Do they have good work? Are they giving me the information I need? If I'm a publisher and this is all I see, I'm out of here. I I'm not interested. So right. again, you need to make decisions about, okay, what is this for? What am I really after? And for now, if this is what you're happy with, that's fine. But I'm saying that if you want to go beyond your sort of inner circle of friends, you're going to need to make some changes. And that that's your personal call. Right. Uh, one thing I want to say is that um, the reason why I curated the website, uh, I was curating specific tour for design corporate, uh, like corporations and studios. And um, the one I searched and targeted tour to suits that kind of specific of a style. As you said earlier, we have a lot of 
I have a lot of work that's more diverse, and I don't want to have this hot mash of different variety of work all like stock up on one website, uh, which could be a confusing thing for the audience. But uh, I would say this is targeted towards two specific audience, and it did actually get me a job. Uh, I sent them my website, and they replied me with their interests. Um, but in the future, I. I get your point. Once I want to actually publish work, I will have a more curated uh, website that have more personality and want people to stick around uh, longer. Well, so Jack, you make a very good point. It's sort of similar to what Tamara said earlier that to get her job, she actually didn't show them the website, but rather just showed the images on the iPad. Okay, that's fine. But what I'm really thinking you all need to think about is sometimes these opportunities that come up, you have no notice. I mean, I've right. had people who just like, boom, one day somebody was in the place that a publisher said, hey, do you have an idea for a book? And if you come in and you're like, oh yeah, maybe I'll think of something. That is not appealing. I know somebody right. who got a graphic novel because they already had it. They had the pitch, it had been sitting there. Nobody had taken it up as a publisher but when that publisher asked for the pitch this person said oh here it is and that's such a big difference so the whole thing about these things it's like you have to think about them as being ready to go so that way when the opportunity arises you can just give it to them so yes in this particular circumstance with your job the website was not really a problem obviously it wasn't you got the job but there are other circumstances where it might be and that's where you just want to cover all your bases. Like you don't want to miss out on something simply yeah, be because the publisher has no sense of humor, you know? <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. Cool. All right, everybody. It looks like we are out of time for the workshop. And sometimes depending on the number of people who enroll, we do have time for a Q and A or discussion but there's obviously a lot of activity happening in the chat, which is fantastic. And I wanna tell all of you, you're gonna have access to this channel for another week or so. And I really want people to spend the time in here while you have it to follow up on some things, because I suspect one thing that's nice about a focused workshop like this is it's an environment that's created to talk about these things that are oftentimes difficult to do with friends, with artist colleagues, a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. And I'd like to hear from people if that is the case. And so now that we've gone through everybody's stuff, we've looked at all the things that people are talking about that they're struggling with. I wonder if over the next few days, we can put down some of our reflections. I sort of stuffed your brains tonight, two hours <laughs> looking at this stuff, but some of this will take time to process. And I would also say, as that experiment, Try that post that you were afraid to do. Let's see what happens and then report back, okay? And then the other exercise that I recommend for people to try is, I think I posted a link earlier, I'll send it again, but it's where you observe your own behavior. How do you look through your feed? And so you look through your feed, you say, okay, what are the posts that I just ignore because they're boring? What are the ones that I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna take time to write a comment. What are the ones that annoy you that you go, oh, this again? What are the ones that you just say, oh, I like this. I'm just going to tap like, that's it. I'm not going to write a comment. And you will be surprised that the way you want to interact with social media as a viewer does not align with what you are doing as an artist. So I'd be very interested for people to try that. And then I will also have an evaluation form. It is totally anonymous please be candid, write whatever you think we can do to improve these workshops, because um, I really want to make sure the experience is smooth and that you're getting um, the kind of exchange and conversation that's going to help you with this. So yeah, everybody, um, thank you so much for participating and I'll see you around.